Well, thanks for sticking around for this uh, last talk before coffee bre break, and uh, to the organizer for giving me an opportunity to uh, show you some work on uh, uh, influenza seasonality and climate factors. So this is work done in collaboration with many people, but I would like to point out in particular Jeff Shaman, who's going to uh, give a talk later uh, in the morning, but also Ginny Pizza and Dan Weinberger uh, were here in the audience. So uh, I will uh, talk about two studies looking at influenza seasonality and climatic factor, one on a global scale and a more detailed study focused on China. And then I will talk about two different disease systems, um, two different viruses, respiratory syncytial virus and uh, rotavirus. So um, for influenza, it's been uh, long known that, that, uh, and described that there's marked wintertime seasonality in temperate areas of the world and that seasonality is less well defined in tropical regions. Um, but the drivers of seasonality have always remained unclear. There's been recent interest in the role of specific humidity, and I will get back to that in a second. Um, and also there's been a number of epidemiological studies trying to link climatic factors such as temperature, specific humidity, uh, precipitation, uh, and influenza, but in specific location, and not really a global view of what the relationship could be uh, between the climate and influenza. So here we were, tr we were really trying to, uh, to have a global uh, explanation of why influenza is seasonal in some places and not so seasonal in others. So in this graph, uh, we're just, this is just an example of uh, how diverse the seasonality of influenza is around the world. The world. So um, in uh, north, uh, northern US and pretty much all of the US, we have very seasonal epidemic with most of the uh, viral activity concentrated in winter months. Uh, in reverse, in uh, so the southern hemisphere, temperate regions such as uh, Australia, uh, we have also very strong uh, seasonal pattern in, in their winter season. And then in some tropical places such as Fortaleza, um, we have also very marked uh, seasonality, uh, while in other uh, equatorial places such as Singapore, uh, we have year-round circulation with some epidemic uh, peaks in, in, in distinct years. Uh, and uh, the problem with linking influenza uh, and climatic factor is that not that we are, uh, don't have good hypotheses, we have too many of those hypotheses. And uh, uh, here this is a, a cartoon from a review that uh, we did a, a year or two ago, um, trying to assess some of the evidence for uh, the links between climate and influenza. And so climate could act uh, upon different um, 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 steps of the transmission process, in particular in, in terms of contact rate, virus survival, and immunity. And for each of those processes, there's been uh, uh, evidence that there's a link with climate. For instance, it's been uh, our, our seasonal factor. For instance, it's been suggested that uh, contact rates will vary according to school schedule, but also to temperature and uh, precipitation, uh, and that also travel and workflow, which varies between the year, uh, within the year, could also affect contact rate. In terms of virus survival, there's been also some uh, uh, data on, on the role of humidity, both relative and specific, and temperature on survival, but also uh, uh, solar radiation. In terms of immunity there's, uh, uh, in the human host, there's even uh, many more, more hypotheses, uh, in particular involving humidity, photoperiod, selenium, and temperature, uh, but also a bunch of vitamins. Uh, in particular, the people in, in, in Britain are really uh, intrigued about the idea that vitamin D could, uh, could drive the seasonality of influenza, uh, and also the idea that perhaps viral interference with, with other pathogens might um, uh, drive some of the seasonal cycles that we see. So really, uh, many, many hypotheses, and, and is there just one or maybe a, a combination of hypotheses that uh, is able to explain the uh, patterns that we see globally? So uh, just a word on some uh, interesting experimental data, uh, both uh, in animals and in humans, that have suggested that there's a link between uh, uh, environmental factors and influenza uh, uh, transmission. So here this is from uh, a few years ago, experiments in guinea pig in a Peter Palesis group, uh, showing that uh, transmission uh, of influenza between those guinea pigs through aerosol uh, varies with re both relative humidity and temperature, and in general, uh, lower level of um, uh, temperature uh, and humidity uh, favor uh, transmission. There's also been some interesting older experiments uh, in humans uh, from live vaccination trials uh, uh, done in Russia 
uh, in the 1980s. So it's basically uh, an infection with uh, an attenuated virus, but a, a real infection. And you see that the, the, the response of the human vaccine is, uh, depends on the season uh, and is actually uh, high, there's a higher response in winter uh, with increased body temperature, increased probability of virus isolation, and increased serological response as compared with those that are vaccinated in summer. So this suggests that there might also be a, a role of season on human uh, immunity. Um, and so just a, a few words on uh, really interesting work that uh, uh, Jeff did a few years ago trying to reinterpret the, the animal, the guinea pig experiment that I've just told you about in terms not only uh, uh, of a, uh, on, on, on terms of relative humidity and temperature, but combining this into this measure of, of specific humidity and showing that this is a, a, a much more parsimonious way to explain the relationship between uh, transmission, influenza transmission and environmental factor uh, with um, lower le levels of specific humidity favoring transmission. And that's also true in terms of uh, uh, virus survival. And this was follow, uh, followed by the, uh, uh, a nice study uh, looking at epidemiological data in the US and variation in specific humidity for the year. And uh, you see a drop in specific humidity a few weeks before the onset of, of the influenza season. Um, so that's uh, also a good explanation, uh, I mean, a, a good explanation for, for the uh, seasonal pattern that we see uh, in the US. But the question is, does that work also for other regions of the world, in particular tropical and equatorial regions? So um, we've uh, compiled, uh, we've tried to compile as much uh, epidemiological information uh, on influenza seasonal pattern as we could from locations around the world. Uh, and this is a, a study that's just about to come out in, uh, in PLOS Pathogen. But here we uh, managed to find information both from the literature and from an electronic surveillance website for 78 locations with a good coverage of the, of the tropic, about one third of our sample is in the tropic. Uh, and um, of course, a, a, a large underrepresentation of, of uh, Africa, which is still uh, quite uh, undersampled in terms of influenza surveillance. But based on this literature uh, review, we can assess the timing of, of peak influenza activity Activity and try to uh, relate this with, um, with climatic factors. Uh, so this is a, a, a plot showing the distribution of the timing of influenza activity across the 78 locations that we have in the data set, so from November to uh, uh, for a full year, uh, as a function of latitude. And you recognize a very marked winter seasonality in the uh, high latitude northern hemisphere as well as in the high latitude southern hemisphere. And the, uh, in the um, intermediate region, uh, there's much more variability in terms of uh, when the peak timing of influenza occurs. So uh, we've tried to link those data with a, a range of indicators, uh, environmental indicators, including precipitation specific and relative humidity and temperature. And here uh, we're looking at uh, where we see for specific humidity. And so uh, for each site, we've looked at uh, the peak timing of influenza and what was the level of specific humidity in that month of, of peak influenza. And um, this is plotting here in the, in the dark um, uh, solid line the uh, proportion of sites that have influenza peak at different levels of specific humidity. So there's a, a higher density of location having peak influenza at low level of humidity, but also high levels of humidity. And the gray uh, shaded line in the background represent the expected distribution that we would have under the null hypothesis, where there's no relationship between the two. Uh, and so if we break this down by tempered site, we see that most, most of the tempered site have uh, a flu peak in the low specific humidity season, which agrees with uh, uh, Jeff's uh, hypothesis from, uh, from his earlier work. Uh, and uh, in contrast, in tropical site, uh, most of them are the influenza peak in the high specific humidity se season. We can also plot the uh, data uh, as a function of uh, minimum specific humidity that each location experienced throughout the year. So here the locations are sorted by uh, those levels of minimum specific humidity. The, ran the uh, gray bar represent the range of variability of specific humidity in the different locations. So you see that in some locations there's very little variability and in others there's large variability in specific humidity. And the uh, uh, black dot represent the uh, uh, humidity level in the month where influenza peaks. And you see that for all of those locations on the left hand side of the curve, which tend to have min low minimum levels of humidity sometime during the year, well, this is when they will have their peak influenza seasons. While in other locations which ha have uh, always have high levels of specific humidity year-round, well, influenza occurs in the uh, month of highest level of specific humidity. While intermediate zone that uh, spans a, a threshold here of, of specific humidity around 10 to 12 uh, grams per 
per kilogram, uh, you can have influenza peak pretty much either in the high humidity month or in the low humidity month, and that's also where you find locations with two influenza peaks uh, during the year. So then we can um, uh, work out a, a relationship between the probability of an influenza peak as, as a function of specific humidity, and you see this uh, uh, trough of, of, of probability of occurrence of influenza around 10 to 12 uh, gram per kilogram. So if we did the same analysis with, with temperature, we would also find a, a pretty similar uh, threshold for temperature uh, with a location that uh, go below uh, 18 to 20 uh, degrees um, Celsius, having also a, a high probability of an influenza peak during their winter months. So um, a specific humidity is perhaps mostly a marker for, uh, for when an influenza peak may, uh, may occur, but it could be that the, the relationship between climate and flu occurs through other uh, environmental factors. So next we try to use the uh, climate-based predictions to predict peak timing of influenza in our data set. And uh, so this is a result from uh, different uh, models, uh, both univariate and multivariate. And we see that the uh, model that has both temperature and specific humidity has the best predictive power, which is not excellent, but it's 70%, it's so it's not bad. Uh, and, and in particular, the prediction accuracy in temperate region is very good. Uh, in low latitude region is, is reasonable and really where we have trouble predicting uh, something is in those mid latitude regions that, um, that um, crosses this threshold of, of um, uh, 10, uh, 10 to 12 uh, gram per kilogram of specific humidity. Uh, some of the other models do uh, less well, but uh, if you look at the model uh, that, has precipit uh, that have precipitation or relative humidity, they tend to be uh, uh, quite accurate in terms of predicting flu in low latitude regions just because uh, they predict that flu will occur during the rainy season, which we, what, where we see in the data. So next we can use this model to predict um, um, the uh, seasonal behavior of influenza uh, in different regions of the world where we don't necessarily have influenza data. And this map represents the probability of having a cold and dry peak, so a peak in the winter pretty much in purple, uh, versus the probability of having a peak in the humid rainy season in green. And you see that in the middle latitude region, uh, that's where we see uh, the occurrence of, uh, of, um, of those humid and, and rainy peaks. Um, and uh, this is the model here based on specific humidity, minimum uh, level of specific humidity. We would have a very similar prediction if we use the model based on minimum uh, uh, temperature, uh, except that those models disagree quite a bit in, in what they predict for Africa, uh, with uh, uh, Central Africa here uh, having a, a large probability of a large area and a probability of rainy uh, humid peaks, uh, while the model based on specific humidity uh, has a much restricted area of those uh, humid rainy peaks. So if we had more data from Africa, it would be a good way to distinguish between the role of uh, uh, temperature and, and specific humidity perhaps. And uh, there's hope here because there's actually a, a lot more data coming, uh, coming from Africa uh, in, in recent years. So. So in the, in the analysis that I've just uh, shown you, we've used very crude data, uh, very crude me measures of influenza seasonality. It was basically just the peak timing, but we were able to do it for many different locations. Here we've, we've tried to see whether uh, the same model that I've shown you uh, before based on temperature and um, specific humidity was also good at predicting the, the whole seasonal distribution of influenza cases during the year. Um, and so here uh, we see <coughs> some um, uh, seasonal distribution of influenza in, in brown uh, for, uh, based on data from the WHO surveillance website, FluNet. Um, and so it, you see that in some sites we have very strongly seasonal distribution and in other sites we have more year-round circulation uh, of the viruses. And then the uh, blue uh, and red line here represent the predictions of the model. So we are uh, quite able to predict year-round circulation in Vietnam and, and uh, more seasonal distribution in countries like Senegal and, and Tunisia uh, and our predictions are, are less accurate in, in other places. Um, and you see here the uh, differences in, in climatic factors in some of those regions. Um, using uh, some, uh, 
some of these more uh, uh, refined method to characterize seasonality uh, that's relying on time series, we can also uh, measure something like the seasonal amplitude, which is uh, a measure of the difference between uh, the minimum and the max uh, um, uh, of the number of cases in a year. And we can see strong relationship with latitude. So here it's again using data from FluNet, a, a much larger data set because we cover 85 countries, but it's a, a much uh, more aggregated spatial scale. So not necessarily good to uh, look at relationship with climate, but good to have a, a broad view of what the seasonal patterns are. So we see here in the Northern Hemisphere a strong relationship between uh, latitude and seasonal amplitude, where places that have uh, that are at high latitude have a higher seasonal amplitude of influenza cases. This is for the Northern Hemisphere. This is for the Southern Hemisphere, coded by region. But you see the same, pretty much the same relationship in both hemispheres. Uh, we can also look at peak timing. Um, and we also see a nice uh, gradient where uh, countries that are at higher latitude tend to have later epidemics in the season, and that's true again both of the northern and the southern hemisphere separately. The other nice interesting uh, thing here is that those uh, uh, horizontal bars mark viability in peak timing between years, and we can show that there's more viability in those uh, low latitude regions than there is in the high latitude region in when the peak of influenza occurs. Uh, and uh, finally, differences in epide epidemic duration as well, where we see that the places uh, at lower latitude tend to have longer influenza seasons than uh, places at higher latitude. Um, so um, a few more words about uh, some uh, recent work that we've, uh, that we've started with uh, collaborators at the Chinese CDC looki looking at uh, more refined time series data from different provinces in China. Uh, where they have a good surveillance uh, for, uh, from 2005 to now uh, for the 30 different provinces uh, of China. And China obviously is a, is a great country to look at because it's, uh, the population is so large, but also climatic drivers are so different, uh, as well as socioeconomic drivers uh, across provinces. Uh, so here the color code uh, on this graph represents the different climatic zones uh, of China. So uh, blue and, uh, sorry, red and uh, brown represent the uh, uh, more uh, temperate regions. Blue is uh, uh, subtropical and there's here one province in the really tropical area in, in, in southern China. And so we can look at the seasonality of influenza in those different regions which are here uh, uh, sorted from north uh, down to south. And so you see very strongly seasonal cycle of influenza cases. So the red represent high intensity of flu, uh, yellow and, and uh, light yellow is low intensity. So you see the strong uh, seasonal uh, vertical bars here representing seasonal cycle centered around winter month in about half of the provinces. And then uh, below 33 degrees of latitude, uh, you see much more uh, diverse seasonal cycles um, and, and, and less clear seasonality. So this is just the same uh, uh, data, but summarized here into uh, an annual seasonal distribution or seasonal signature of influenza. And again, you recognize a strong uh, seasonal winter focus of epidemic in the north of China and uh, more diversity in the south. Uh, but with the, um, I mean, the idea that perhaps in those mid-latitude provinces, we have two uh, influenza peak um, during the year, one in the winter and another one in the summer. So we wanted to quantify those patterns a little more. So we fit a time series model to those data to estimate the annual amplitude, the timing of the epidemic, and the uh, strength of the uh, semi-annual to uh, annual component. So uh, whether there is a, a semi-annual cycle or not. Uh, and so we see that the annual amplitude is stronger in the north of China as compared in the, uh, with the south of China. That epidemics tend to occur later uh, in the north of China as compared with the south, which tends to have summer epidemics. And also that the mid-latitude provinces of China uh, tend to have a, a stronger semi-annual component, so uh, two uh, epidemic cycles within the year. We can also try to define epidemiologically homogeneous region, and this is very useful for our Chinese collaborators at the CDC because they're about to embark on the, on the national vaccination campaign, but to do this every year, you have to know something about the time of, timing of influenza activity. And so the idea would be to break down China into uh, broadly epidemiologically uh, similar region to be able to uh, um, to vaccinate people right uh, in time for the influenza season in those regions. Uh, and so by uh, doing a, a, a cluster analysis of uh, the time series data, we uh, see that uh, we see three different uh, regions 
uh, the region here on the right, which is the temperate region where epidemics occur in, um, in the winter. The region on the left here, which is uh, the southernmost region of China, which has summer epidemics. And here, the uh, middle latitude regions, which uh, have two epidemics within the year. So if you wanted to vaccinate, you would vaccinate here before the winter in the north, before the uh, summer season in the south and in the middle latitude. Well, that's the question. Would you vaccinate twice in the year or just once in the year? But um, during the, I mean, that, 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 that remains to be seen. But at least there are three different regions that uh, need to be considered. And then we can look at climatic factor uh, as well as over geographic and, and travel movement patterns that best discriminate between uh, those uh, three different regions. And we see an effect of temperature, humidity, um, um, as well as uh, uh, solar radiation, I think that's what's here, in, in, in discriminating between those patterns. This is more of a, of a, I think, a preliminary and exploratory analysis here, just because we have only 30 different provinces, and that's really not enough to, um, to run a, a, an analysis based on a lot of uh, different uh, uh, potential factors. But uh, presumably, if we had uh, similar time series data uh, from a lot of locations around the world, we could uh, run uh, those types of analysis. And uh, the last bit of, uh, of uh, information about China, which is quite interesting, is that we were able to break down the analysis by different sub types of influenza. So uh, there's uh, two types of flu, flu A and flu B, and within flu A, there's also uh, different subtypes. Uh, but we see that for flu B, we, which have a, uh, we have a much more pronounced winter seasonal pattern that we have for flu A. So blue represents uh, a timing of activity uh, concentrated around the winter month, and then uh, red is uh, in the summer month. Uh, so basically, uh, flu B is winter seasonal throughout most of China, except in, in southernmost uh, Hainan province, while flu, ha, uh, flu A has, has more uh, a diverse pattern of activity. Um, and that's intriguing because uh, uh, the animal experiments, unfortunately, were only done with flu A viruses. Uh, so we don't know whether flu B viruses respond differently to environmental condition than flu A does. Uh, the guinea pig, mo guinea pig model works for flu B, so uh, I think they're going to maybe do those uh, climate experiments at some point. But it would be really interesting to see whether there's an interesting differences in the virus or whether it's a difference in the host uh, with flu B, for instance, ex uh, infecting uh, more children, which might have different contact patterns than adults. Um, so in summary, um, I think we're just at the beginning of working out the relationship between uh, influenza seasonality and climate. There are a lot of, uh, of possible uh, climatic factors that could be associated. But we see, we see strong geographical variation, in particular attitudinal gradients in seasonality, in seasonality, in seasonal amplitude, and timing of epidemic uh, across the world. Uh, based on our global study, we see a, a bimodal relationship between specific humidity, where both low levels of specific humidity and high levels of specific humidity favor transmission. So the low level part um, of the relationship can be well explained by the, the experiment, the animal, and the, uh, the animal experiment that have shown that virus survival and virus transmission uh, increase it at low levels of humidity. The, the um, relationship where high levels of humidity favors influenza transmission is more difficult to explain. Uh, we don't have any uh, good mechanistic explanation, but it could be perhaps through uh, the, um, the hypothesis that behavior changes uh, during the rainy season, people congregate more, and so there's higher crowding. Um, it's it's, it's uh, difficult to test, but maybe, uh, maybe we'll be able to do that. We see thresholds of specific humidity and temperature that define whether influenza will occur during the cold months or during the rainy season months. Um, and overall, seasonality in the middle latitude is, is really difficult to predict. And here, we think that perhaps there's some impact of other uh, factors, non-climatic factors, such as population travel. Um, and that's a, a, an interesting uh, area to study. We also see interesting seasonality differences between flu A and flu B, uh, which remain to be clarified. And I think of all this, uh, this also begs a, a question that we always get. Um, okay, so flu is less seasonal in the tropics. Does that mean there is more or less disease in the tropics? And unfortunately, when we're not able to, to answer this very basic question about how much flu there is in different areas of the world. So that's also an interesting uh, area for uh, future study. Okay, so in the last few minutes, just a few words on, uh, on ongoing work on the seasonality of uh, rotavirus and respiratory syncytia virus. So those are two different disease, viral disease systems. So rotavirus is an enteric virus, and RSV is a, is a, a respiratory virus transmitted uh, 
through pretty much the same route as through, probably through a combination of uh, direct and indirect uh, uh, transmission. Oh, well, what did I do? <laughs> ah, good. Um, so in the, same, uh, in the same way that we compiled a, a, a global uh, image of the, the timing of flu activity around the world, we were able to do the same thing for RSV, even though there's a, a less uh, publicly available data, but there's quite a bit of literature uh, in RSV. And so we see the same broad pattern that we see for flu in that there's more winter seasonality in, in the northern hemisphere high latitude and southern hemisphere high latitude. But there's also uh, some suggestion that there's a little bit more variability than, than for flu. And here already for the US, you see that uh, there's differences in timing of RSV uh, that we don't necessarily see for flu at the same scale. But it would be uh, relatively uh, interesting to, to do the same type of analysis that we did for flu uh, with those RSV data. So we also have more uh, resolved uh, RSV data for, for the US. Uh, this is what I'm showing here. So this is a map of the timing of activity in, the, in uh, counties for which we have enough uh, hospitalization data. And you see a, a strong variation in, in timing. And this is very consistent between years with epidemics starting in October in, in southern uh, uh, Florida and uh, uh, starting much later in the north uh, west and northeast of the US with about a three month lag between the earliest county and the later county. And so if you correlate this against uh, uh, different geographical factors such as latitude, but also temperature or humidity, you see uh, a strong relationship. And so we're still trying to, to work out uh, the details of which climatic factors is associated with RSV. And also trying to reconcile the fact that this is pretty much a winter bug uh, that, uh, but even though it's a winter bug, it has earlier timing of onset in Florida, which is a very warm place. So we're still trying to, to, uh, to work on the, the, mechanist, uh, the mechanism here uh, that explains why, why RSV is so spatially structured. Um, and to finish, just a few words on, uh, on uh, rotavirus, which, uh, which is this uh, enteric virus uh, for which we now have a vaccine. And Ginny has done a lot of work uh, on this disease system. If, if you want to uh, learn more, just uh, really talk to her. But this is also from a recent uh, uh, review of uh, rot uh, rotavirus seasonality that's uh, uh, coming out uh, uh, in a Pediatric Infectious Disease Journal with uh, our CDC colleagues. And that also shows a, a lot of viability in uh, in uh, rotavirus uh, timing of activity in different areas of the world, with perhaps even more viability than what we see for uh, RSV or, or, or influenza. And so in this, um, in this review, uh, we also tried to correlate uh, the seasonal, seasonal patterns of rotavirus against uh, a range of uh, demographic as well as environmental um, and socioeconomic factors. And we found actually that uh, uh, temperature of rain, rainfall explain little in, in, in the seasonal amplitude of uh, uh, rotavirus, but uh, income actually explain uh, more of the viability. Overall, the model here only explained 13% of the variance, which means that we still don't understand a lot about rotavirus seasonality, uh, but there doesn't seem to be a clear link with uh, climatic variable. And then Ginny has also done some uh, really nice work linking uh, differences in birth rates and transmission rates uh, in different places of the world with uh, differences in seasonal patterns. So it looks like for rotavirus, there's no, perhaps not such a, a clear uh, uh, link with climate. So, so in summary, there's a lot of similarities between those three different disease systems, flu, RSV, and rotavirus, in that these uh, are acute winter seasonal viruses in temperate um, in temperate regions of the world, they're all, both, all the three of them are directly transmitted and imperfectly immunizing, so you get reinfected throughout life. Um, and for all three of them, you could probably say that there's marked winter seasonality in temperate area and less pronounced seasonality in the tropics, but actually the, the drivers of seasonality uh, differ quite a bit. Uh, and so I think we really need uh, global studies like those types of study to, to try to uh, um, match epidemiological data against climatic factors as well as demographic and geographic factors to try to understand the drivers of seasonality. And also thinking about the effect of uh, birth rates, transmission rates, socioeconomic uh, factors, population mixing, and also differences in, in, in circulating strains. So um, thank you very much to my collaborators. Uh, the flu work was uh, done in, uh, in the context of a multinational influenza study that uh, we have at, at NIH at the Fugit International Center, and that involves many collaborators uh, around the world. Thank you.